Friends, good morning and welcome to worship here at Richmond Presbyterian Church. I'm Victor Kim, the lead minister, and I want to welcome you as we all gather together and worship God. Friends, this morning we mark VST Sunday, Vancouver School of Theology Sunday, and I'm delighted to welcome in worship leadership um, Jacqueline Cleland, and Jacqueline is a student at Vancouver School of Theology, and Jacqueline will be helping to lead worship as she brings words of greeting and then reads uh, scripture and leads us in the prayers of uh, thanksgiving and intercession later on in worship. So we want to thank Jacqueline for, for that leadership. Also from the Vancouver School of Theology and playing drums for us this week is Samuel Landry, and Samuel will be well known to many of you in the congregation member of our congregation and is studying at VST and he's filling in for James who's not st who's still not quite feeling well enough to be with us for 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 music. Um, continue to look in the bulletin announcements that Maureen has emailed you about information about Vancouver School of Theology including the Explorers weekend coming up and the news about uh, updates from Vancouver School of Theology and we want to remember in prayer uh, the Reverend Dr. Richard Topping, who is Minister in Association here at RPC with us and a good friend of ours. And we want to remember in prayer Richard for his leadership and for all the students, faculty, and staff at VST this morning. Um, today is the Sunday of the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity, and there will be an ecumenical service held at St. Saint, Saint Joseph the Worker Parish. Um, and a link has been sent to you from Maureen for that service, which will be broadcast live on YouTube at 5 p.m. today. I'm the preacher for that service this year, so if you want to join us for the week of prayer service, click on that link from Maureen at 5 o'clock today. Um, so following readings from Jacqueline, you'll also have announcements from Anne-Marie, and then after that, we'll move into our gathering song, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. Hello, my name is Jacqueline, and as you can tell, I'm virtually joining you from the Vancouver School of Theology. I even have one of their awesome t-shirts to play. So today, this Sunday, is VST Sunday. And what that means is this is a Sunday that students of VST, which I am one of the lucky people to be able to say I am, we get to share and talk about what an amazing school the Vancouver School of Theology is. So not only is it amazing, but it's amazingly amazing because it's a 50 year celebration. That is so cool. They have made this year agreements with Jakarta School. They have a new dean, there's new hires. It has one of the biggest amount of school enrollments this year ever. It is doing fantastic. and has a lot of opportunities that you can join in and do too. So they have some guest lectures coming and you can go to the VST website and find those public lectures register and they will send you the link to be able to participate yourself. Now, if you're interested in going to seminary or taking some classes or just exploring your faith, they also have an Explorers weekend, February 4th and 5th, and it's all on Zoom. You can do it from your couch, which is pretty awesome. And if you want to register or learn more, jleaves at vst.edu, she'd be happy to answer any and all of your questions. Good morning. I have just two notices for today. Faith formation time over Zoom at 11.15 for elementary age students. And connection time for young adults, grade 10 through um, whatever, <laughs> uh, 1, 1 p.m. again over Zoom with our guest this weekend being Stuart Hallam, an Anglican priest, and um, he's also worked as a commando trained Royal Navy chaplain, and he's been involved with youth work, done anti-oppression youth training. Come and let's be in conversation about themes of mission and vocation. Hope to see you soon. Bye.
Join me in our call to worship. God alone is our rock and our salvation. We will not be shaken. Trust in God at all times, O people. We will pour out our hearts to God, our refuge. In this time of worship, let us turn our lives to God and accept the good news. We will listen for Christ's call and follow him. Friends, let us worship God. Our praise song is the song Cornerstone. Please join me in the prayers of adoration and confession. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you've called us together as your people. You've called us your friends and you invite us to follow you. And so your church has grown from scattered homes in ancient times to a worldwide community embracing men and women, old and young, from many nations and cultures. In our worship today, Inspire us to wonder at the miracle of your church. Help us to see the privilege we share to be part of your people across the ages and across 
all the continents. It is your love that keeps drawing us to you and to each other. And so we offer our wonder and praise with millions of people who also gather in your name this day. God of all the ages, we gather in worship week by week, hoping to encounter your presence, but we confess it's not always easy to hear your voice. Sometimes we get distracted by what's happening around us. Sometimes we get confused by conflicting views of what you expect from us. Sometimes we feel challenged and resist a new word from you. And we confess it's hard to churn our lives around when we think we already know where we're going. Lord, forgive us and have mercy upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends in Christ, believe the good news. Believe the good news that God's steadfast love endures forever and that love is for you. It is so that we may be forgiven and restored and made new. Trust that that forgiveness is for you and be at peace with God, with yourself, and with one another. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. In the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Thanks be to God. Let's continue in our worship. Our hymn is 699, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Let us praise God together.
us gather now for the reading of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, including verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go to the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed in God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. The next reading is Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men or people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed Jesus. You've heard me say before that one of the challenges of being a minister is that sometimes people you don't know ask you what you do. And as a minister, you never know how your answer will be received. Today is the Sunday of the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity. It takes place in January of every year, and it's an opportunity for the church ecumenically, right? Different denominations, different traditions to get together and celebrate our oneness as Christians in Jesus Christ. Um, some of you will have heard me share this story before, but I want to repeat it again today. A number of years back, while I was still back in Calgary, during one of the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity services, um, the Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Bishop of Calgary back then was a man named Fred Henry. And Bishop Henry told a story about a flight that he took to Toronto. Now the bishop was a, he was a very short, short man, and he always wore his clerical collar. Right? He always wore his clerical collar whenever he traveled because in part he knew that uh, there were people that he would meet that would have issues with the church, right? And he felt that by identifying himself as a priest that he could serve as someone to whom people could uh, vent their anger and their frustrations about the church, that they could vent those frustrations to him, on him. And so, he boarded his flight, and as he was sitting there in his seat wearing his clerical collar, he saw a woman walking down the aisle of the plane. And as she, grew, as she drew closer to him, the bishop could see that she was carrying a big Bible in her arms. And he silently um, offered a prayer, um, please, Lord, no. Um, but as she came closer, he saw her eyes look up at the seat number above his seat and uh, looked into the open seat beside him. And she broke into this big, huge smile. And as she moved into the seat, she looked at the bishop and said, Are you a priest? Yes, said Bishop Henry. I am the Bishop of Calgary. Well, may I ask you a question? Ask the woman. Sure, sure, said the bishop. Have you been born again? Ask the woman. Well, I believe that I have been, replied Bishop Henry. But the woman was not yet satisfied and she was quite persistent. But have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And so the bishop replied, 
Yes, I have. And you would be very pleased to know that this very morning when I woke up and sat on the side of my bed with my feet touching the ground, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior again. And he said, I don't think it's something that you should only do once. In fact, every morning when I wake up, I do the same thing so that I'm reminded that it's not about some formula or some words that you might just say once, but that my faith is about something that I'll do as someone who has accepted the Lord. My faith is about what I will do as someone who has accepted the Lord. We all thought that it was a very good response, but Bishop Henry never did tell us the rest, how the rest of the flight went. There's a Lutheran minister named Martin E. Marty, and um, he tells a story about a friend of his, another Lutheran minister, who was traveling on a very, very long flight to Taiwan. And inevitably, during this flight, the minister's seatmate on the flight turned to him and he asked the question, so, what do you do? And Marty says that his friend was tired of answering that question, and he knew far too well the response that his, that his answer might bring. So he decided that he would just shut this conversation down, even before it got a chance to get going. And so Marty's friend, the Lutheran minister, said to his seatmate, I'm a neurosurgeon. I'm a brain surgeon. How interesting, said his seatmate. So am I. You know, what people do, what people do interests us. And you know, it's, it's always better. It's always better to tell the truth. It's always better to tell the truth. People are curious about our motivation uh, and how we have come to do what we do. As you, as you watch the rest of these midweek meditations that we've been uh, resuming, um, I'm gonna ask people, how do, they, how do they get to do what they've done um, in whatever field that uh, they've chosen to do it? If you watched this week's meditation with Jani, our music director, uh, you learn that, that music has always been a passion of hers. And um, when she didn't do it, she missed it badly, very, very much. And that uh, she quotes someone who says that when you're a performer and you perform music, it touches something in you. That, that doesn't get touched unless you do that. And so this sort of motivation is really interesting to us. Whether you're a musician, whether you're a neurosurgeon or a minister or anything in between, right? And I think Bishop Henry's response to the woman on the airplane emphasized that faith is about what we will do. Faith is about what we'll do as someone who has accepted Jesus as Lord. As someone who's accepted Jesus as Lord. You know, for those of us who would call ourselves as disciples of Jesus, right? As those, as those who are born anew, born of the Spirit. We know who we are. We know who we are. If we know who we are, if we know who we are, the question then becomes, what are we going to do with our lives? What will we do with our lives with the time that we have left? Our readings this morning tell of two stories. They're both call stories, both stories of God's invitation. One to the prophet Jonah, and the other to four fishermen on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Now, as we know, <clears throat> when the call of God came to Jonah, Jonah ran from that call as fast, as, as fast and as far as he could. You see, the call to Jonah, you see, was not an easy call. It was a call to Jonah to go to a city called Nineveh. This city Nineveh was the capital city of Israel's most feared and brutal enemy. The call to Jonah was to go and proclaim to the Ninevites that God was angry with them. And Jonah didn't want to go. Jonah didn't want to go. He didn't want to go because he knew what might happen. He knew what would happen. He knew that if he did go and proclaimed to the Ninevites God's anger with them, that the people might repent that they actually might listen and repent. And Jonah knew that God was gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And Jonah didn't want God to relent from punishing the Ninevites. He wanted God to punish the Ninevites because they were his enemy. They weren't just any enemy. This was the enemy that would eventually invade and conquer Israel 
killing Jonah's family, his people, brutally putting an end to the kingdom of Israel. It's no wonder Jonah doesn't follow God's call. He runs away. He stows away in a ship, right? Until the storms force his shipmates, on Jonah's own advice, to throw him overboard to save themselves from destruction. And after three days in the belly of a fish, Jonah repents and he is spewed up onto the land. And there the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And this time, Jonah obeyed. Jesus walked along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And there he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing their nets into the sea. They were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately, it says, immediately, they left their nets and followed Jesus. A little later, Jesus saw James and John, two brothers, the sons of Zebedee. They also were fishermen, and Jesus called to them as well. And immediately, the text says, they left their father in the boat with the hired men, and they followed Jesus. Two call stories. In one, Jonah tries to run away. In the other, the fishermen follow Jesus immediately. Where do you fall? Where do you fall? What's been your call story? What has been your call story? Do you have a call story? We all, we all do. We all do. You know? Maybe you think, well, I've never been called by God. Maybe you're like Jonah and you're running away as fast as you can. Even as you come to church regularly, even as you're watching this service online. Maybe you're watching today because it's taken you a couple of times. It's taken you a couple of times or more before you heard God's call, before you responded to it, before you accepted it. Or maybe you're like the disciples in the text this morning who only needed to be called once because they knew what a call from Jesus meant. You know, the, the, the call of Jesus to the fishermen to follow him the call of Jesus to the fishermen to follow him was a call to a life as a disciple. It was the call to a life as a disciple. And in those days, it was only the best and the brightest who were called to be disciples of a rabbi. It was a big deal to be called, to be invited, to follow a rabbi. You know? and, and they said that uh, to follow a rabbi, to be called by a rabbi, was to be covered in the dust of the rabbi. Because you followed that rabbi so closely, and back in those days, you didn't have too many paved roads. And the, the rabbi would kick up this dust as he walked, and his disciples would be covered in the dust of their rabbi. You know, to be a fisherman, to be a fisherman, though, was to have been rejected as a possible disciple. Because you weren't smart enough, you weren't talented enough, you weren't good enough. You couldn't be a disciple. So he ended up being a fisherman. But then here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus. He's a rabbi. And he's not inviting, like, you know, and, and he's inviting those that are not good enough, right? He's inviting those that are not good enough, not talented enough, not smart enough to follow him, to be covered in his dust. And it doesn't take a second call. You follow immediately. Maybe that's your story, eh? Maybe that's your story. Maybe Jesus called you and redeemed you from wherever it was, whatever it was, whoever, whoever it was that told you that you weren't good enough, good enough to be loved, good enough to be cared for, good enough to matter. And when Jesus came calling, you said yes right away because you wanted that. Maybe your call story is something different still. I don't know. I don't know. But I know you got one. I know you got one. We all do. We've all got a call story. But as important as our response to God's call is, I think the more important truth is the nature of the one who calls us. The nature of the one who calls us. The one who initiates this conversation with us. God calls us because God loves us. Because God loves people. God desires to use us by calling us to share the good news of his love with as many people as possible. Now, I don't know why God chooses to use people to get that good news across. I just know that God does. I just know that God does. And that call to us, that call to us to follow, 
to be fishers of people, is to be, is to be part of God's plan of salvation, right? Follow me, says Jesus, and I'll make you fish for people. Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Did you hear that? Did you get that? Eh? Follow me, not so that you can be saved, but so that you can fish for people. Follow me so that you can fish for people. Follow me so that others will get to hear about me, so that others can follow me as well. Every call story, every call story is a story to go to others. It's a story to go to others, not just so that we who follow can be saved, but so that others might know that salvation as well. You know, Jonah was called to go to Nineveh. Why does God care so much about Nineveh? I mean, these were pagans. They were idol worshipers. These were a people of viciousness and unspeakable cruelty. It was told that the Ninevites would skin their enemies alive. They would skin their enemies alive. A lot of us, when we try to put ourselves in Jonah's shoes, we would find it almost impossible to understand God's care for the people of Nineveh, right? And a lot of us in our own situations today find it hard to understand why, why God would care about some group or some person or another. Some group that we find objectionable, that we despise, that we think are not deserving of God's grace or God's mercy, God's steadfast love. But if God only did what we could understand and what we could agree with, would God still be God, right? Would God still be God? And would such a God who only did what we could imagine, would such a God be worthy of our worship? If God, if God wouldn't love the unlovable, the Ninevites, and the Ninevites of our lives, if God wouldn't love the Ninevites of our lives, what would be different? What would be different about God from us, right? The good news, the good news is that God does love. And God does care for every, every human being, every person who has been created in God's image, made in God's own likeness. God's ways are not our ways. That's both the greatest hurdle to our faith and also its greatest hope, right? God's ways are not our ways. It's the greatest hurdle to our faith, but also our greatest hope. We may refuse God's call, we may run away and hide because it's just too difficult and we just don't understand it. Or we may follow immediately because we know just how unwarranted and how undeserving we are of that invitation. But whatever our decision is, whatever our decision is, the fact is that God will not stop loving us. God will not stop loving us. God will not stop calling us because God loves us. Yeah, there are going to be some unwelcomed consequences, at least unwelcomed from our, from our perspective and our point of view, right? Because, because God loves and because God calls, those that we might consider unworthy, undeserving, immoral, right? They might, they might hear the good news of God's love and, and like those Ninevites, they just might repent, right? They just might repent. They might say, I'm sorry. And it may not be good news to our ears. It may not be good news to our ears. We who prefer that those who deserve God's wrath would actually get it, right? But I get the sense that it would be good news to God. I get the sense that if someone repents, that it's always good news to God. I think there's something even in the Bible about that, right? So this is the God. This is the God in whose image we're created. This is the God in whose image we are created, whose likeness is in us, whose nature calls us, calls us to seek to be like our creator, to seek to be like our creator. This is who we are. This is who we are. It's who you are. It's who you are. So what will you do? What will you do? What will you do with the time that you have left? What will you do with the time that you have left? doesn't matter how old or how young you are. I know that I have fewer years left ahead of me than those years that have already passed. And for some of you watching this, that number is really, really lopsided, right? On the side of the already passed. For others of you, you're probably just, maybe you're just beginning the journey. 
but in the time that you have left, as much or as little as it may be, and really, who among us really knows, right? Who among us really knows? But in the time that you have left, what will you do? What will you do with it? Will we admit, will we admit that God does care about what we do? That God has a desire for us, a desire to use us to be conduits, to be a vehicle for his good news, of his saving love for others, for others, for those around us, no matter how few or how many? Or will we pretend not to hear or run from God? You know, we cannot change our past. We can't change our past. But we can follow a different path for our future. Right? We can't change what we did with the time we had, but we can change how we're going to use the time that we have left. The old quote sort of goes like this. Sorrow looks back, worry looks around, but faith looks up, right? Sorrow looks back, worry looks around, faith looks up. I want to suggest a slight correction. Faith in a God who calls us to follow is always focused on others. And it doesn't just look up, right? It looks ahead. It looks ahead. It looks for others. Faith looks ahead, looking for others. We're all called. We're all called, all of us, you and me. We all have a story of God's calling. Some of us are called to be neurosurgeons. Some of us are called to be musicians. Some of us are called to be ministers or priests, thankfully not most of us, but we are all called. We are all called. We're all called, not, so, not just so that we, we might know God's love and grace, but especially so that others will know the love of God and God's saving grace through us, through God's Spirit working through us. The call, the call is to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus in fishing for people. It doesn't mean to get people to recite a formula or a phrase. It means to get up each morning, put your feet on the floor, and pray that somehow that day God might use us to impact the life, right? Maybe it might mean that God uses us to bring a bit of joy to someone who needs to be told that they matter, that they have value, that they're worthy of love. Maybe it's to bring companionship or company to someone who's isolated because of this pandemic, someone you've been thinking of, maybe even praying for, someone you might just choose that day, that morning, to call, or maybe even write a letter and mail it to them. It might be sticking up for someone who needs a friend, an ally, someone who might be an advocate for them. It might mean sharing your story, your sense of call with someone who's hungry for meaning, who's, who's hungry for meaning and purpose and direction in their life. Maybe it means loving someone who just isn't easy to love. To fish for people means that we allow God to work through us in the ways of love and service, justice and compassion, so that someone who doesn't yet know God's love for them might come to know that joy and might be transformed by God's Spirit at work in and through us. We all have a call story. We all have a call story. Jesus calls each and every one of us. It's a beautiful and joyous invitation. Because God's love and God's mercy is as wide and as diverse as the creation that God has made. And those who know who we are, those of us who, we know, who know who we are, in whose image we're made, whose likeness we bear, I pray that we would, we would aspire to love like God loves, that we would aspire to, to be in our nature in the way of God's nature. And I pray that we might be willing to follow, to follow when God comes calling. And, I, and friends, I, I can't think of a better way for any of us, I can't think of a better way for any of us to spend the time that we have left than to follow Jesus, to be covered in the dust of our Master, of our Lord, and to be able to tell to be able to tell others about him. 
Friends, to God be the glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Let's continue in our worship to God as we respond to God's word. Our praise song is the song, One Desire. Let's praise God together.
Jesus asked his first disciples to answer his call with their lives. Our offering is one way that we answer his call and carry forward his ministry in our world. Consider what Jesus could accomplish through your gifts today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you called ordinary men and women to follow you and join in the work of God's reign on earth. We offer you our gifts to share in the work that you began through them. Bless our gifts and continue to work through us that the world may know your love and that your grace is still active among us. Amen. Let us now gather together for the prayers of the people. The following prayer was adapted by one written by a fellow VST student, Martin. The world is passing away and the realm of God has come near. Let us then believe God and pray that the whole world may perceive the glory of God's marvelous work, saying, God of steadfast love, hear and have mercy. For minds to change at the appointed time, for the peace of heaven and the salvation of our souls, for the peace of the whole world, for all who proclaim the message, for the unity of all, we pray. God of steadfast love, hear and have mercy. For bishops, presbyters, deacons, and other ministers, the laity everywhere. For Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, President Joe Biden, for leaders of all nations, and for all in authority, for our city, for every town, 
and village, and for those who live in them in faith, we pray, God of steadfast love, hear and have mercy. For those who deal with the world, for those who fish with nets, and those who leave them to fish for other people, for those who went a little farther, for those who traveled by land, air, sea, and water, a space, for the sick and the suffering, especially those who we name aloud now, in the silence of our hearts. And for those we intercede for electronically, we pray, God of steadfast love, hear and have mercy. For those who mourn and those who rejoice, we pray. For all of us who repent and believe the good news, for the deliverance of all from affliction, strife, and need, we pray. God of steadfast love, hear and have mercy. All loving God, the time is fulfilled. Remember your son Jesus who said, follow me, and announce that the kingdom of God has come near. Make us to be ready and to get up and go to proclaim the good news wherever you send us. From now on, strengthen us to turn from wickedness and live. Our prayers we bring to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the words you taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I want to thank again Jacqueline for her participation in worship leadership today. Our hymn, our closing hymn is 648, I'm going to live so God can use me. Let us praise God. Friends, go to be covered in the dust of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who calls us, who calls each and every one of us to follow him. Maybe you already do. Maybe you're covered in dust. Great. Continue to follow him. Maybe you once did, but that dust has been washed off, and it's been a while. Why not return and renew that sense of call in your life today? Maybe you've never known what it's like to be covered in the dust of Jesus. Why not make a decision to respond to his call to follow him today? You know, none of us know, none of us knows how much time we have left, but all of us have a choice in what we will do with the time that we've got left. All of us have a choice in terms of what we're going to do with the time that we've got left. So friends, May we choose, may we choose to join God's mission and follow the ways of the, of the one who invites us to fish for people. 
as you go, know that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit will go with you, will rest with you, remain with you, will abide with you and with all those whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen.